So when I talk to someone about effectivity, it usually begins with what you're trying to accomplish, solve, or make better with the factory. I want to know what you know. I can show you the product up, down, and sideways, right? But I need to understand what you're trying to do. And it's my job to try to to fit the product into your process as, as simply as I can for your operator. So understanding that person, what that person's looking for, is paramount. This is the ERP Organizational Change Journal podcast, brought to you by Nestle & Associates, a Newport Beach, California-based ERP organizational change management firm serving the private equity industry. The ERP OCJ seeks to share expertise, insight, experience, and research, and to create effective conversation to help guide ERP organizational change to real, measurable, and verified success. And now, here's your ERP expert and host, the founder of Nestle & Associates, Dr. Jack Nestle. Hey, Jack here. Today we're going to dive into Manufacturing Execution Systems, or MES, Overall Equipment Effectiveness, or OEE, Industry 4.0, and more. All of us here at the ERP OCJ hope you find this podcast useful as we share lessons learned, discover best practices, and explore the human element component of ERP organizational chain. In this episode, we will discuss Industry 4.0, MES and OEE value proposition with Mr. Oscar Schwartz. Oscar is the Director of Operations at Factivity. Factivity specializes in shop floor data collections, paperless factory, labor tracking, and OEE software. And their product is Factivity MES. We will discuss one specific MES manufacturer's approach to successful assimilation. We will discuss and explore the value proposition of MES, Industry 4.0, OEE, Technology-Driven Industry 4.0, ERP, and MES integration, as well as OEE and MES myths and mistakes, the Internet of Things, the definition of MES success, MES differentiators. So let's learn more with our guest. Joining us from Cleveland, Ohio, Oscar, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for inviting me, Jack. It's going to be a pleasure talking to you today. Absolutely. Really looking forward to you uh, sharing your insight. Our listeners will find this conversation useful. But before we get started, Oscar, if you can do me a favor, please tell us more. Uh, further introduce yourself to our listeners, if you would, please. Sure, sure. Name's Oscar Schwartz. I've been with Factivity for about 30 years now. When I started, the company was actually known as MDSS, Manufacturing Decision Support Systems. I know it's a big name. That's why developers like myself don't really like acronyms. <laughs> uh, or actually, no, we do like acronyms. We use them more than we use real words. Right. Uh, anyway, uh, MDSS was a ERP company back when you would timeshare uh, onto a mainframe and use those things like modems. Uh, there were no networks and lots of green screens. When uh, many computers were introduced, we started with an HP 3000 in this case, and you could actually run our software on premise, which was you know kind of new because you had this mini. In the very late 1980s, uh, John Liebert, who was the company president at the time, saw the need for more interaction and a bigger focus on the shop floor. At that time, MES wasn't even a name at that. You know, it was called shop floor execution. So he put together a small group of the developers from MDSS and some sales and application managers, customer managers, and discussed the factory floor. Uh, and came up with the term Factivity, which is factory activity. I joined in the early 90s, just after they put this together, uh, as I had experience in the programming language and the operating systems they were planning to use. Uh, after a short time, I was the lead developer and onto the product manager for the MES product. The company also changed its name to Factivity to show that we were focused on what we were doing with the shop floor. And I moved, as you said, to director of operations and oversee all the activities now. When we started the Factivity product, as I said, it was an evolution of networks and understanding Windows, because we were still in Windows 3.1 and then Vista 95, all of those evolutions, including the Windows Server. At the same time, we were introducing our base Factivity to our MDSS customers, okay, as well as some new customers who didn't really yet understand where shop floor products were heading. Today, we have small customers, large customers. I can give you a couple of names, some like Elmira Pet Products, 
or PPG industries use Factivity at single sites with uh, employees that number between a few dozen or well into a thousand. We have some others, Keystone Center and Metals, Lancotech Medical, America Trim, which are multi-site with large U.S. presences. Sankoban High Performance Systems uh, has a large international footprint, and they've chosen Factivity to be the MES for many of their locations and some of their subdivisions. Very interesting, Oscar. Interesting story, and to see that and hear the success of Factivity and the evolution is, is really a pretty cool story. So thank you for that. And you said you've been with Factivity for, what, almost 30 years then? Yeah, I think it's going to be my 30th in a few months. Yeah, well, interesting. Well, super. Well, thanks for that, Oscar. Appreciate it. And before we get started, I think it's prudent to mention that NNA is vendor neutral. And while in practice and research, we do work with ERP and MES vendors, their partners and vendor specific SMEs every day. We currently have many vendors or partners queued up to be on our podcast, in fact. And while we consider all friends and colleagues, some we may have worked with previously and some we may not have worked with previously, but nonetheless, NNA approaches ERP and MES selection uh, I would say, in an academic research-based way. And please contact us anytime to learn more. In our conversations, in fact, with our software vendor colleagues, uh, as today with Oscar, we, NNA, take a vendor-neutral approach in our podcast with open-ended questions, and we just love to pick the brain of our guests so that our listeners are more informed, and then we leave it up to our listeners to reflect. That being said, I will say I know Factivity well, and I know it to be a, a solid product, so I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So, Oscar, if you can share with our listeners, define for them MES. What is MES exactly? Okay. Well, MES, Manufacturing Execution Systems, is part of a framework laid out for industry, and we'll just say X.0. Um, <laughs> it's around in a lot of different flavors, and it's more than a buzzword that you've heard before called data collection. Um, sometimes we're rather embarrassed when an MES gets called just simply data collection. It's an effective collection of data plus other things, and we'll talk about some of those. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about them. But in a lot of cases, we never get past data collection. Some sites, including sites that Factivity have been involved with, never kind of plateau, if you will, at data collection. They never really get to explore all of the other things. MES is made up of multiple products or modules or concept, not sure what best word to use here, but I've seen it defined as a set of circles with each vendor wrapping the parts that they provide or have major focus on. But let's look at data collection for a moment. So if I'm an operator on the floor, I've been given a piece of paper that I need to write down my badge number, maybe the shift, certainly the date. Then I will probably write down the job I was working on, the order number, the part number, and finally what it is that the office is going to need, whether that was how long I was doing this, how long the machine was running, uh, how many good products did I make, and now that could expand to scrap. So maybe I have to tell how much scrap I made. Maybe I have to also tell it the materials that I used, and those materials may have attributes like lot numbers or blend numbers or serial numbers, so that may need to be collected. In some cases, I need to directly link that material lot number to that finished good I did, like a heat number on some metal. So in a way, I'm turning it, this into a huge piece of paper. Well, that's MES 101, data collection. Now, hopefully, MES makes that simpler and easier. Okay. Some of the how might be to use things like barcodes, scanners, okay? and then the barcoding itself has gotten more sophisticated to cover more and more data, RFID, QC codes, 2D barcodes, and a whole lot of scanners to read it, including that smartphone that's in your pocket. Mm -hmm. Maybe we call all of this data collection 2.0 or 3.0. Um, I mentioned materials. Maybe I need my MES to actually handle weighing materials or be able to adjust a recipe or blend based on the viscosity of one of the materials that I'm using. I might also need to look at inventory. So I need to see what's in my inventory in my enterprise system. And maybe there are certain lot numbers that I'm supposed to be using, allocations. So I might need to see them too. Visibility is a big part of MES. Okay. What is it you're giving to the operators that's going to make their jobs easier? 
and certainly and hopefully more accurate. You know, can I eliminate some, most, or all of the paper that would normally be using today as part of writing all this stuff down? Uh, maybe I have more stuff. Right? Maybe I have documents like drawings or work instructions. Maybe there are just comments from the last shift or the last time I ran this part. Seeing what I need to do and having what I need to do it is a key responsibility of MES. Then there's the other side, and I could talk about the data. Are those employee hours collected, needed for time and attendance systems or time and attendance module or needed to support an external payroll system? I know we want to send this data to an enterprise system. Right? If I've got an ERP system, they're going to need to know the data. So what are they going to need? Machine time, labor time, time by status, runtime, problem time, downtime, uh, production quantities, material consumption. All of this has an impact on customer service, shipping, and certainly the cost of the product. What's another level of MES? Well, who are my star operators? You know, who are those people that are the best at what they do? And, and I'm not talking as a big brother here to say, you know, who should I hire and fire? But maybe if Joe works this machine today, rather than Susan or Ralph, we'll get a better throughput and I'd be better off putting that person on a different task that they do very well. MES has all of that data. So a lot of words, but basically you can see MES has a lot of things going for it that are focused exclusively on the shop floor. So Effectivity started as an idea of what our MES or shop floor execution was to be. And we grew as we learned more from different industries and different manufacturers. Okay? Even how we associated labor time and effectivity changed from just an attribute of a job where it said this job took three hours to saying, well, it took three hours during the hours from three to four and produced this much product and we connected this. So even we changed our own thinking as we evolved the product. So hopefully I've yeah. given you a lot here about That's great, Oscar. Yeah, no, that that's a really well said uh, definition and explanation of MES. Uh, thank you very much for that. So my follow up question would be: You'd mentioned initially that MES systems or manufacturing execution systems, it's part of the framework laid out for Industry 4.0, I believe you'd said. So that being said, can you explain to our listeners what exactly is Industry 4.0? Yeah, that's an interesting one. So if we say Industry X.0, right? So MES has been around for a while and mixed in all kinds of different areas. But let's talk about Industry 4.0. Being able to grow with the technology is what industry, whatever level you want to use, is all about. So if we think about Industry 1.0, Right, we're probably talking about systems pre-electrical built on water and steam. And then we evolved to Industry 2.0, where we have start to introduce electricity and assembly lines. So 2.0 in itself takes a big move forward, as you can imagine. Yeah, right. Then we hit the next level, right? 3.0, which is computers. And this is not as we see them in 4.0, but this is just being able to take a computer to drive a machine or have more precise and productive um, automation, right? Uh, the use of robots, you know, another huge move, right? But in far less time. 4.0 is just a natural growth of that. Manufacturing thinking larger than that one single element. Some of the items I spoke about in MES begin to overlap industry 4.0 initiatives coming out of 3.0, you know, from ERP or MES or WMS, TMS, you know, through an endless list of acronyms again. You have <laughs> Right. Enterprise systems, shop floor systems, warehousing systems, transportation systems, all using computers. When we look at Industry 4.0, you take this usage of computer technology and grow it. Grow it how? Let's start with data, big data, right? If I could take the machine data from my factory and apply maybe artificial intelligence to it or machine learning to it, you could not only predict automatically when you might have a machine failure, but be able to predict throughput by machine or by site, plant, region, country. I think you can understand how adding the internet helps make this possible. I think you also need to consider the smart technologies at the time of what we have now. I mean, you have your phone, your home, your car, you know, IoT, Internet of Things, data and technology, Industry 4.0. They all work together. Yeah, excellent. Thanks for that, Oscar. It'll be interesting to see what Industry 5.0 and Industry 6.0 looks like. So 
Oscar, a lot of times in the context of uh, context of MES, you hear people talking about OEE. And as I'd mentioned uh, during the introduction, uh, that's a topic that I'd like to cover with you. But of course, that means overall equipment effectiveness. What does that have to do with MES and how do they relate? What's the relationship between the two? Yeah. Uh, OEE is an interesting one because we do hear people say, well, I'm looking for an OEE system. And not truly understanding that it's one of many metrics. OEE is generally a term that looks at the data in a very defined way. Uh, I once had a plant manager tell me that with effective OEE numbers, he not only could see if his factory was productive, but also could keep on schedule and make all of his customers happy. So OEE, as you said, overall equipment effectiveness is a measurement of several key production metrics. Right. A score of 100, sometimes expressed as 100%, is perfect. Generally, if you're at 85, it's considered world class. Uh, and that's you know where you're trying to get to. But honestly, most chime in at about 60%. Let me explain why a little bit. We'll take some kind of numbers here and put them together, and you can see how this works. Sounds good. Uh, yeah. It, so there are three numbers. One of them is availability. So it's the total runtime, just runtime, okay? divided by the time the equipment was available. So if my machine was available 24 hours a day and I I only got 18 hours of runtime out of it, I'd be at uh, 75, 75%. Okay, not a terrible number. Uh, I wish my kids got at least that in school. But anyway, (laughs) uh, performance measures, the second one, performance measures the output of the equipment. So this involves... uh, which sometimes is a mystery, which is the ideal value, which is how fast that piece of equipment can actually run. So if you take that ideal time and you multiply it by the total quantity, now this is total count, not good and scrap, and then divide this by your runtime, which we use back in availability, then you get this performance. So another example might be if my ideal cycle rate is one second per piece, and I multiply that times the 59,000 pieces I got today. I think if number of seconds in a day, 86,000, something like that. Um, so let's say I got 59,000 pieces out today. And I divide that by the 18 hours that I work. Well, that's about 91. Very, very good score. It gets you an A in school. Okay, so we got a good number there. Now we have to look at the quality, our third metric. So now we have the good divided by the total. Pretty simple number here. So we had 59,000 total, only 55,000 were good. I'm going to use that number in my example, which gives us a pretty good percent, which is 93. So I've got really good quality. I've got really good performance, and my availability is not as nice as I'd like to have. it. What's interesting about these metrics is, again, on their own, they don't look bad. And on their own, I'd be pretty proud of them. But the overall OEE number is the key. And how you get that is you multiply the three together. Now I have a number that's 63 Mm. when I multiply those three together. So now, wait a minute, in school I went from a C, an A, an A down to a D. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So it's a very interesting thing. Now now let's let's do a little tweak here. So even if we add um, to my availability of the equipment, and instead of 18 hours, I'm going to add go to 22 hours. But I'm not going to change anything else. So I'm still producing scrap at the same rate. I'm still producing my output, you know, just do the math to come out the same things. So I'm still producing uh, at 91%, 93%. Now when I add them together, which I now get 91%, so I have 91, 91, and 93, and I get it up to 77. Hmm. So the overall OEE number does look a little weird here. But is it an effective metric? Sure. And you can see why the plant manager I spoke about used it as part of a metric for him moving on and on. Sure. Well, what's MES's part? Well, it should be collecting this information, right? But the other part is it should be collecting it and a whole lot of other values and a whole lot of other interesting data that you're going to either analyze or you're going to use in graphs and gauges and reports. You know, Industry 4.0 wants to get a hold of all of this. I mean, this is big data. Yeah, right. So so in other words, Oscar, OEE is almost, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a tool that MES leverages, like Factivity, you, through what APIs and PLCs and so forth, you can feed the actual, maybe the machine information, 
into the MES and use that to help create big data, create more data, right? Uh, help, yep. help kind of put the big picture together. Absolutely. Is that a fair uh, statement? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's really the level of data that you're going to focus on. Uh, uh, who's going to do it, right? One of the things that uh, has to do with, you know, let's talk about data scientists, right? It's a big career. I wish uh, my kids would have gone after it. Yeah. Uh, but it's a big brain power, and they're using these big BI tools and lots of computing power to figure out all of this stuff across big data. Uh, yeah. But then most plants are probably just going to have somebody with an Excel spreadsheet looking at last month's production data that somebody wrote on time cards. Yeah. Could you come right. up with OEE on it? Well, yeah. And you probably could get metrics that you could at least see that, well, I probably should start dealing with my scrap and stuff. And I should start dealing with the number of hours I put on the machine. And that, that was a, a very helpful uh, definition and explanation, again, of OEE. And so really in terms of the three metrics, right, that determine your OEE score, the availability, performance, and quality, if anyone claims that they can get 100% or they are getting 100% OEE, I guess, score, they're probably not being realistic or even honest. You know, if, if they're using OEE as a way to determine your availability, performance, and quality. Yeah. Remember that most see around 60%. Even with my decent numbers that I came up with, mm -hmm. I still was only at 63. And I got it up to 75 by increasing my availability. But because I had some other issues I really need to focus on, even though I was at 91 and 93 on that, you know, if I push those numbers up, I could probably get closer. Um, so, that's why they kind of say 85 is that ideal number you want to try to get to because i think it's it's really difficult to get beyond that so would you say based on your 30 years of experience uh in working with your highest performing organizations they're typically right around that what 75 to 85 percent even for the best of your yeah i guess performing organizations or organization uh, performance i should say <laughs> i'm going to say yes to that only because i don't want to get in trouble with any of them <laughs> yeah i believe most of our most of our clients, um, the reason that they're moving to MES, the reason that they're integrating machines, the reason they're using more Industry 4.0s is to try to get better and better and better. Yeah. But again, just to, for our listeners, I mean, Factivity, MES, leverages, I, I guess, this operational data or OEE, but you integrate through APIs and PLCs to help you collect that information, correct? Yeah, Part of the industry 4.0 and the more you can integrate into machines is a big deal. Yeah. Factivity also has some things that deal with what we call machine monitoring, right? So we're focusing on the operator. Then how can we enhance the operator experience, right? Can we start to pick up data from machines to enhance what they're doing? So with Factivity machine monitoring, okay, we can connect to the machines through various different methods and start to pick up that data that enhances the operator experience. So now they don't have to come to Factivity and say, yeah, I started running, yeah, I started some setup, I have a problem here. For using machine monitoring, we can pick that information up and make Factivity push the buttons for them, if you will. Yeah. One thing that Factivity does not do is we never ask the operator how long you did something. That's all handled within the product itself. You're just telling Factivity, I'm running now and go and do your work. Right. Okay. Uh, or the machine could tell it, well, Factivity just went into a run status. Okay, so now it'll collect the time for you. And we're trying to make the experience for the operator as uh, simple as we can. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, so Oscar, you provided our listeners with a definition of MES, uh, Industry 4.0, OEE. You know, you talked a little bit about how they're, they're related, the relationship between the three. And then when you concluded the last question I asked you, you'd mentioned that Industry 4.0 wants to get a hold of all of this, you know, <laughs> all of this data, right? This big data. So my next question then is, how do you select technologies for Industry 4.0? And I know that seems to be a pretty general question, but... What does that look like, and how do you know you're in vain of this idea of Industry 4.0 and collecting big data? Do you have anything to say about selecting technologies that help you get to that end game? Yeah, and that, that's a real good question and, and a little difficult because it has lots of answers, and those answers change rapidly. You may pick something that actually has a better way of doing it six months later, or perhaps you're dealing with older equipment. Do you switch out that equipment for something better? Do you find integration methods to it? 
you know, the, the choice you pick can determine you know, how you want to do it. But most of it is going to be on where you're focused, right? Do you have a focused, manageable plan, right? What are you trying to get? What, what's that data you're trying to get out? And are you going to be able to connect to it to get it? So I want to make sure that my machines are running as much as I can all day long, that we have very few problems with the machine. You know, then I'm going to focus myself on that data, focus on that. Some, well, I need to know a lot more about other things, maybe things that are important to what you're doing, but they don't focus on OEE. And, and OEE, it doesn't fit everywhere, right? If I'm assembly or something like that, I'm going to have a whole different way of looking at OEE for those type of plants. There are lots of good products here. Um, focused on either automating the machine process or the collection of this granular machine data. Uh, these products connect to, as you mentioned, the PLCs or get electrical signals, you know, maybe that legacy equipment that I talked about, or use other devices to accomplish this. But it's generally going to involve the work of your own engineers and other third-party integrators in a lot of cases. There are technologies, so there's an industry standard technology called OPC, Open Process Control, which was developed by machine manufacturers. And with this, you can connect uh, machines on one side, and there are drivers for all kinds of machines. Most companies that create the PLCs, that create the machines, uh, also have drivers to talk to standard OPC servers. And then on the other side, you have your MES or whatever other systems that need to get this data. Typically, it's a subscribe publish model. So if there's an OPC server in the middle, I subscribe to it as part of the MES, as part of activity to this particular event. And when that data changes, it'll publish that message back to me. So now Factivity can map that to an action that Factivity does. You can also read these, so you can just pull this data all day long if you want information. So the OPC server is a nice method to do these kind of connections. So is it, Oscar, it's not so much getting too caught up, as you'd mentioned. I mean, technology changes very quickly and, you know, emerging technologies and, and especially with the evolution of AI. And so it's not so much getting caught up in the technology, perhaps, as it is just really understanding where your organization wants to go and understanding exactly what that looks like and what data you want to collect and then finding the right tools to help you get to that end game. Now, that's not to say, you know, clearly the technologies, you know, change and can have a substantial impact on your ability to timely and effectively and efficiently get that data and manage that data and, and so forth. But I think part of what you just said is it's not only important in understanding the technologies that help you meet the end game of Industry 4.0, but it's just being clear about what it is you're after to begin with. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. If you don't take a focus on it, then I think you're just going to have lots of data that for most of what you're trying to look at is meaningless, or you may not know how to interpret it to actually mean something. Industry 4.0 is not a checklist. Hey, it's not like I can say, yeah, uh, have, I've checked off Industry 4.0 and the three items that make up Industry 4.0. It just doesn't exist that way. Uh, you talked about Industry 5.0. Is there truly a 5.0 yet, or is it just marketing? Right. Some say that about 4.0. It's just a marketing uh, to sell product. Maybe it'll help sell us. But <laughs> yeah. So, Oscar, that being said, how exactly is industry 4.0 changing and expected to continue to change manufacturing? Can you get out your crystal ball? Where is manufacturing heading because of industry 4.0, or at least the idea? Yeah, and in, in this computerized uh, like aura that sits around companies and their operations, it can't help but take factories to the next level, right? Again, focus on the data. What is it you're trying to get out of it? What are you trying to improve? Hey, that's a big, big, big deal. Startups today have to be thinking that, right? Company expansions, uh, acquisitions, okay? All of that bring along their learned Industry 4.0 uh, knowledge and initiatives and products. And activity sometimes goes for the ride there uh, for yeah. those that have it. And as that continues to grow, I mean, companies and the products that drive their business will also expand and grow too. It has to, right? So as you have, continue to bring in more and more um, ways of manufacturing, uh, machines that are involved in manufacturing, and uh, just about everything you can bring in, you have to grow. So I think Industry 4.0 is, again, it's not a checklist. I almost think of it as a concept to move more and more to thinking a little bit outside the box. So not just what I produce today, but how can I do that better tomorrow and the day after? 
Interesting. And so I think on that note, um, Oscar, I, I would actually like to share, maybe just dig a little bit deeper in that thought and uh, and just share a comment or I guess a statement that's on the Factivity website that, that caught my attention. And that says, uh, quote, manufacturing companies today realize that factory floor data collection is simply not enough to stay competitive. Beyond accounting for labor time is a growing need for the real time visibility and real time solutions easy to use information tools can help management optimize schedules, eliminate bottlenecks, minimize scrap, shrink downtime and maximize machine OEE and labor assets, much of which we discussed already. This new set of functionality is offered in the Factivity MES modules, a set of software tools to improve your production process, lower costs and improve on-time delivery. Using a customizable factory floor user interface, our solutions consist of three major software systems, each sold separately with add-on modules for Factivity MES. So can you elaborate for us the Factivity tool set and how exactly it helps improve an organizational real-time visibility? And this is all obviously in vain of the, this whole idea of Industry 4.0, and I think kind of relates back to the previous question. But can you maybe just shed a little more light for our listeners on this idea of bringing these pieces together and how that helps improve real-time visibility exactly? Sure. So Factivity from its inception has always been about ease of use. It's always been focused on the operator and then expanded on. So um, we were, uh, when we first started using touchscreens, touchscreens weren't even a thing yet. Uh, and we had our first touchscreen was by a company who was one of the leaders now, uh, LO Touch Systems. And theirs was a big CRT with this big four or five inch thing that sat in front of the screen. And uh, you know, we were using that to illustrate how you can use touchscreen systems uh, on the floor. But throughout its journey, we've added several modules and integrations to take you beyond this thing that I talked about, which is data collection, you know, which is the MES 101 uh, that some people just don't get past. Machine monitoring. How do I enhance what the user experience is by getting information directly from the equipment they're working with? Right? We talked about machine monitor and OPC servers. Um, we've also added a new product called Factivity Connect, and this opens the door to other third-party products to interact with an MES okay, connected to the enterprise system. So if you're an engineer or an integrator, you can focus on the machine and its data and not concern yourself with the MES or having to rewrite an entire MES system or worry about how to integrate with the enterprise. Um, Factivity Connect lets you get all that information out. Uh, in a lot of cases, some of these systems that are built around the machine are called SCADA systems, and there are some really good products here. Uh, one comes to mind, Ignition from Inductive Automation is very popular, very powerful product, uh, which some of our customers use to interact with their machines focus on the machine, and then use Factivity Connect to talk to the MES, who's talking to the enterprise system, and work back and forth. When we looked at the user, okay, and we needed to give the user a more up-to-date experience, we created Factivity Ultra. So it's a UI designer that contains a large palette of a whole bunch of visual elements from flashing buttons, gauges, charts, um, that you can actually put on a screen for a particular area of your factory. Um, you can also use it to create some non-interactive dashboards. So it's got a lot of things that you see in today's, um, what are under this category of dashboards. Another part that's very important in the entire MES picture is scheduling and advanced planning and scheduling. Um, there's sometimes some thought, the difference between sequencing and scheduling. So, you know, sequencing, I've got a lineup. I might be in my uh, office every morning and we're figuring out the lineup, the sequence that we want to run today. Um, advanced planning and scheduling is taking all of that, which you do, uh, try to automate it on steroids. Uh, so it takes a look at all that data and basically um, comes up with a schedule that fits the entire floor and looks all at your downstream operations, your upstream operations uh, from the machine availabilities to your people availabilities to all your resources. Factivity APS is a solution that we have that combines a very powerful world-class APS system from Planet Together and a lot of years of Factivity integration and knowledge um, for some select ERP systems. So then we work together with this, we flow the data back and forth, and we dispatch that 
through the MES. So the MES becomes the focus on the floor, and all of these other systems are working to make that experience um, seamless and certainly advantageous. Great response. I, I really appreciate that. And, you know, when you talk about this idea of real-time visibility, what I just heard you say in your answer, there's multivariables there. There's many pieces to that. And one is, as we discussed earlier in this conversation, behind the scenes, it requires, as you just said, seamless integration, you know, the right tools behind the scenes and properly integrating OEE information uh, to your MES and having effective user interfaces that are easy, right? It's easy for the operator. You make it simple as possible. And the idea of interactive dashboards to make it easy for the operator uh, and, of course, advanced planning and, and scheduling tool, uh, you know, such as uh, Factivity APS. In Factivity Connect as well. So I think there's a lot of pieces that need to be considered in order to reach this idea, we'll call it, of, of Industry 4.0 and leveraging the best you can the technologies and the interfaces and the seamless integration. At the end of the day, it provides not only the right data, and as you said, that you have to plan for and really understand the data that the organization is looking for. That's really where it starts. But then you need to put the technical pieces together behind the scenes to make it happen. But then you make it easy for everybody to use, and especially for the folks you know, running the equipment perhaps on the floor, right, um, so that they can focus on their job. And if you can do that and do it well, then I think uh, it's probably fair to say that you're going to meet your end game. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's a lot of moving pieces in a well-oiled machine. Yeah. So in order to make all of the pieces work from your enterprise all the way down to the machine, having the right technologies is a big deal. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's always great, you know, as practitioners to reflect, take a step back and and learn from, you know, every project experience and everybody's mistakes and, you know, just kind of talk through it so that, that at the end of the day, we make the field a better place and we all can contribute to organizational performance. But Factivity has a paper that they shared that's discussing OEE myths and mistakes that helps provide just that insight in order for customers to keep their OEE project on the right track. And so I just want to ask you about that because I, I thought it was interesting and made some great points. But can you share a couple of these myths and mistakes uh, with our listeners? Yeah, yeah, certainly. I'm also going to merge one in from uh, another paper that we have on MES myths because it's kind of relevant in all the things we've talked about. Uh One of them is focus, right? Where is the focus? Industry 4.0 and IoT provide you with technologies, right, to make the machine side of this picture both vital and very confusing. You know, a too broad focus and you're likely not to reach the goals and get overwhelmed with your data. Too narrow and you're probably going to plateau, right? This is what I mentioned with MES and just having data collection. Yeah, right. Um, We have a lot of customers that say, I have an MES system, right? But then when you talk to it, it really doesn't go beyond data collection. And all the years that we've spent in Factivity, you know, we don't want to be embarrassed, but we're almost embarrassed when somebody says, yeah, Factivity just collects the data for me. Well, hopefully we're doing more. That's the point. Now, your OEE one is missing the details, right? An OEE will tell you, yeah, your scrap rate's probably no good. You need to improve your scrap rate. But are you really tracking it? You know, I had 10 good, 2 bad. Um, Well, why were they bad, right? Did it happen because of the time of day? Did it happen because uh, you were starting to run out of product that you were using? You know, could be something else. Could be a lot of different factors. So understanding some of those details are very important. So although the OEE score says, yeah, you might have an issue here, or maybe you don't have an issue here, you have to look at some of the reasons. And MES, one responsibility of MES is to collect that, Mm. is to know that, right? We need to know not only what was good, scrap, and why. Downtime, right? Yeah, you were down. The machine wasn't running. Do we know why? Do we know how long? Maybe it changed while they were doing it. it. It went down. No one could get to the machine for 20 minutes. You know, maybe you have one operator or one setup guy that's working 10 machines and he can't service 10 of them at a time, right? So why? Was it because the machine was down? I didn't have a, somebody to look at it yet. So those are the reasons that MES can collect for you. Material issues, as I talked about, if you have, you know, maybe some things with the material. You know, what was the lot of that material that they were using at the time, right? Hopefully your MES is tracking that. And certainly that's what we try to do in activity. Uh, it also is a part of the responsibility for that to talk to your enterprise system, you know, get the right data back and forth so we can get that kind of detailed information. You know, And so, again, the myth is that 
don't miss the details, right? You think you throw OEE out, I've got an OEE, I've got a light tower that's going green, red, yellow, and uh, think that that's the end of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's well said. I, I love how you said uh, too broad of a focus and you will likely not reach your goals or get overwhelmed with the data, but too narrow and you may plateau. Uh, I think that just really summarizes it well, which means that, you know, again, I think it takes a definitely takes a degree of intentional detail and planning to really understand what it is you're looking for and what you're trying to accomplish. Very interesting. So Oscar, I want to circle back. I, I think the second question I, I'd ask you to define for our listeners, what is Industry 4.0? And part of your response is you'd mentioned IoT or the Internet of Things. So what can you share regarding understanding manufacturing and the Internet of Things? Um, that is maybe how can your business benefit from the Internet of Things uh, in the context of MES and OEE and improving operational efficiencies? Yeah, well, Internet of Things reaches everywhere now. Right? You hear the term with just about anything you do or use that uh, you know is electronic. It's a term that better defines what we can already do today and where the future is going to take us. Right? You have things like Apple Home, Google Home, Watts, Alexas, uh, Surrey, all that stuff. Uh, lots of apps connected to your cameras, your lights, thermostats, doors, windows, even to uh, feeding your pet. You know, the Internet of Things is all of that ability to do that. A simple way to think about IoT and manufacturing is just about control, like adjusting the thermostat in your home. It's just as easy to control, and I could control resources at my factory. So IoT opens the door to what you can control and gets even easier every single day on how you can do that. Now, it's interesting, funny, I look at the ability to change the temperature at my house, and then I think about how many times I actually need to change the temperature at my house. <laughs> Is that ability going to make my company more efficient, more profitable, right? So you do need to understand your goals and clearly define your path here. Yeah. Um, do your homework. You know, as any of these, it's not a plug and play. So I've got IoT, I win. You know, it's, it's not that simple. I think one of the things we're seeing, and, and really this is, I guess, a part of the IoT idea, is more and more using mobile devices, right? So maybe your shop floor manager, or your supervisors, or your plant managers can look at a dashboard on their mobile device at any time and see what the operational OEE is uh, you know, for the latest production run, for instance. There's definitely more and more of that over the last few years, that, that ability to just to be able to watch and manage operations from anywhere in the world. And, you know, we've been on several projects where we've implemented, you know, that level of business intelligence and integrated with the floor, you know, those type of metrics and KPIs, and it can give you alerts and flags, right? So if you have a machine that's running at a certain rate and all of a sudden something happens or it stops and it's, it's not supposed to, you get an alert to your phone, you can look and see what line is down and, and then react appropriately. And pull in more data to help you figure that out. Yeah, exactly. So Oscar, let me ask you this then. Suppose you're at a, you're leading a kickoff meeting, right? So let's say that Factivity just, uh, you just started a project and you're leading a kickoff meeting for the organization that's just starting a MES implementation. How would you define and scribe for them success? What does that look like in terms of a successful MES project? Yeah, interesting question too. Part of the start of this has to be buy-in, right? You have to have buy-in from everybody. The best projects, the best successes require it. There's just no way around it. So when we're about to start an implementation and doing day one training, do we know who the players are that we're sitting around and the people who we're talking to? And do we know as the implementer why they chose Factivity? When we ask them that question, what are they saying back to us? Are they just echoing what the sales guy told them? Do you have people from the floor there? And you know, what do they think? What do they know is the problem, right? We, we often walk into a, a site where the company has already envisioned the way the product's going to work. And then we come in and we try to help them show, well, here's what our product activity is going to do for you. Now, I know that we're on the same page, but let's, let's open it up and start to put it all together, right? And now that I know all that, we can start. We can start to build this. So, and one of the things I also like to think about, there's a huge difference between success and satisfaction. Did we meet the goals that we were trying to do in our implementation checklist? Probably. 
I mean, that's why we were here. But were they satisfied with the solution? Did Factivity or your MES vendor make the adjustments to get them at a satisfaction level that you wanted, Mm -hmm. right? Not the fact that I did A, B, and C, we're good, it's successful. No, are they happy with A, B, and C? Is it the way they envision it working that's going to keep them on that product for year after year? I hope at Factivity we demonstrate that all the time. We certainly tried it. Yeah, and that you're right. There is a difference between success and satisfaction. And I like how you mentioned, you know, the first thing is, is just to align, you know, get the buy-in, uh, making sure that everyone is aligned as far as what they're looking for. Do they know what they want? Do they know why they're there? You know, so you start right out of the gates with aligning to the project goals and objectives. But then, you know, even if you meet those goals and objectives and you check them off the box, there is, there's still that level of satisfaction because it's one thing to check things off the box. It's another thing to do them well and to do them effectively and efficient and low maintenance and and so forth. So that's a very uh, insightful point. So Oscar, you know, I know that there's many MES options out there. And, and so with, with so many options and so many marketing and sales approaches, many organizations having never been through an MES selection previously, how can they focus on looking at the true differentiators with MES vendors, right? So this is maybe tying most of this conversation together is we're sharing with our listeners what these different pieces are, how they work, how they bring value, what's important with a vendor, making sure that they get the right vendor. And I tell people all the time in, in our clients that during the sales pitch, you can often swap logos on the same slide deck and leave the rest, meaning that they all, all seem to be saying the same thing. So what do you say about that? What are some of the things to consider when trying to understand the true differentiators between MES options during the selection process? And what would be your general advice to organizations looking to select an MES solution? So just change the logo on the deck, huh? <laughs> uh, <laughs> excuse me. Well, I hope not. But I, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. Um, I can just think of back in a former life uh, that I had as a teacher. I'm sure you remember that. that we did cave drawings and all that stuff <laughs> uh, at the time. <laughs> anyway, the, the, the same textbook, right? You go in the front, there'd be a list of people that use this. The same textbooks we used year after year. But it was the job of the teacher to make it connect with the student. So when I talk to someone about factivity, it usually begins with what you're trying to accomplish, solve, or make better with the factory. I want to know what you know. I can show you the product up, down, and sideways, right? But I need to understand what you're trying to do. And it's my job to try to to fit the product into your process as, as simply as I can for your operator. So understanding that person, what that person's looking for, is paramount. And I don't think it's too far off the sales playbook as you were alluding to. Um, I personally have a hard time talking to how large your company is financially or your budgets or, you know, that's not the people I'm interested in. I'm more into showing you the product and getting you to imagine it on the floor. How is your operator going to interact with it? Let's look at Factivity's ability to assist your floor personnel, right, and give them what they need to do their job. Uh, that's still one of our slogans, right? Just to give them the information they need to do their job. Mm-hmm. It's not just data collection, remember? <laughs> exactly, uh, yeah. What's interesting, I alluded this to earlier, is some say we already have one or uh, we already do that or just looking for, you know, those are those pieces, you know, where they're just data collection. Um, you know, we've got quality, labeling, uh, the APS I mentioned, uh, and the big one, machine monitoring and integration with those machines. Yeah, we hope the Factivity MES has all of those abilities, and we take extra time to try and understand the customer and the requirements to bring it together. Uh, as I mentioned in the other question there, I mean, we need to consider the operators. And I think it's important for customers to consider their operators first, right? The operators are going to use the product. Is it going to give them everything that they need? Now, you even mentioned dashboards. You know, they're really cool. You get to see a lot of stuff. Um, they got some new charts and they turned to their colors. But does it have any beneficial impact for the operator? Right? If I have a dashboard with gauges going up and down and you know these look really cool, does it really going to make the operator be more efficient, right? Or make their job easier or get better product out? And that's something certainly you need to consider. 
The other thing is no supervisor, no floor supervisor that I know wants their operator standing in front of a computer, reading through a bunch of data or typing a whole bunch of data. They want their math, their machines focused on their job. Uh, we've honestly had customers count the number of clicks it took in Factivity to accomplish a task. Mm. A task. Mm -hmm. And we've had to make adjustments, right? Yeah, we agreed. Well, maybe four clicks is too many or not enough. Right? So, uh, again, focusing on the operative big deal. From the integration perspective, this should just be seamless. Data flows back and forth. And from the operator's perspective, they don't even know what's happening, right? Data just goes back and forth. It's either from the machine to the MES or from the enterprise to the MES. It's not a concern of the operator. They just need the information when they need it. So my general advice when looking at MES is to spend time looking at the operators again and your operations and not just the technology. That's going to make your project successful in the long run. Hmm. That's uh, well said, Oscar. And I, I think you have not only maybe provided some selection pointers, uh, but maybe even a factivity differentiator, right, from your competitors, perhaps. And and that is really focusing on the customer, not trying to sell the product, not trying to sell the functionality, but just really focusing on on the customer and, and also considering the operators, right? And really, at the end of the day, a lot of the MES and the OE stuff that we're talking about, your end user essentially your end customers is the operators. So really hyper-focusing on them and what you can do to make their life easier uh, is a major part of, uh, I, I think should be a major consideration of any selection process. And you know, the other thing you mentioned is this idea of look at the clicks, right? Because a lot of MES systems, they, they all do things just like ERP systems, right? Functionally, they can do things, right? So you can manage AR, for instance, in, a, in ERP, you, you know, they all do AR, they are accounts payable, they do accounts receivable uh, in many, many other functions, but, you know, they don't all do it the same, you know, they do it differently. And so different features in MES, it, it might take, you know, one product, three or four clicks and do it well and do it right and do it effective and efficient, but it might mean, you know, six or seven or eight clicks or 10 clicks for another product to do the same thing. You'd mentioned several times today in our conversation, taking care of the operator and user interface and keeping it efficient. You know, I think that's really good advice. And, and I would say, you know, if we had to distill down the selection process for an MES, I, I think that says it very well. One concept we had in Factivity, which is showing a GAN, right? For those in an office or those working a schedule, a GAN is a very, very powerful tool. Is it a tool at all for an operator? Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> I mean, if I put a Gantt in front of somebody, am I really giving them something that's helpful? So you need to think about that. Yeah. So as one of your, maybe your major pointers for the selection process, if any listeners here, any of their organizations are going through an MES review, or I should say selection process, if the vendor is just completely selected on their functionality and they just want to show you the product, you know, maybe think about that a little bit, right? Is it about their product or is it about the customer? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Oscar, I'm going to put you on point here, uh, challenge you for a second. But if you look back through your 30 years of experience with MES in the MES space, what would you say are three or two of the most, uh, give me two, give me two of the most significant challenges in any MES implementation effort? Oh, these are, I can give you these as firsthand examples. Um, I can't stress buy-in enough. Uh, we have had failed implementations, and they didn't even last but a few months. They probably never got through their first year because one person or a very small team was involved in the selection of product mm -hmm. only because they had a limited vision and they never went beyond themselves or their group. And when you lose a champion at the site, so if you've got a very small group or maybe one person that selected product and they leave the company, which happened in at least two scenarios that I can think of, implementations that I can think of, it was a failed product. So you need to get buy-in from everybody that's going to be involved and you need to involve people that are going to be working on the floor. And the example here is Who's training those people when the new guy comes showing up at six in the morning, right? There's nobody in the office, the people, that person's on vacation that knows the product. Who's the one training them? It's the people on the floor. So if they can't train a person, not only on the machine, all the other things they have to do, but using the MES product, you're probably going to have a failure. So 
definitely having the buy-in and the acceptance and the success and being satisfied about the product all the way down at the operator is super mm. important. Can't stress that one enough. The other challenge is we offer 15 things, let's say, just to pick up out a number, and you never get past number two. And you know from the implementation side that if they were to take a little bit of this or maybe rethink this, we could probably make things a lot better. We had a site that their whole purpose was to look at, I'm trying to remember, I think it was scrapped. So the only thing they wanted the operators doing basically was to record scrap. So, well, the operators, you know, kind of were there in the training of the product and they started using more features of the product. They started putting things into setup when they were doing setup and run and, and doing a little bit more of the product. And management came out and said, hey, what are you, what are you doing? We're only supposed to be recording scrap. And um, they said, well, no, yeah, but it's easy enough to push this. Well, now you have a problem where the focus is just too small to really be beneficial, right? You need to think about where your phase one is, but not stop at thinking about phase two and phase three and where you want the product to end up. Because if you don't, they said it never gets past data collection or it's likely to just mm. fail because you can't get past the first thing. Yeah, uh, great insight. I think most of us that have any experience uh, can relate. <laughs> so true. So Oscar, what would you say is more likely? I have to say, this is a question that I ask uh, many ERP practitioners as well as ERP vendors. So what is more likely that nearly perfect success occurs with no major challenges or some challenges occur, but the organization endures due to a strong culture and therefore success? Wow. I wish I could pick the first <laughs> one. <laughs> and if anybody said they can, I think they may be yeah, hiding something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there are always yeah. challenges. And, uh, and you wrap that up in the question rather nicely. <laughs> uh, even the smallest organizations endure and have great successes. So it has very little to do with the size of a company, but it's all based on the people, the mindset, their focus on the goal. For the largest, yet it may be simpler, as you might be able to throw more resources at it, but still the focus and uh, the mindset of the people is really key. Yeah, I like your answer. It's almost a trick question for those who have spent a, a career implementing business systems. So I want to ask you this and, and maybe give you an opportunity to just talk a little bit more about factivity and the differentiators. But, you know, as you know, Oscar, implementation process and methodology is crucial. And you've alluded to that a little bit throughout this conversation. But what more can you share with our listeners as to how you feel your implementation process is a differentiator from other MES players? You know, do you feel that the way you approach your practice and to ensure success, what does that look like with infectivity? Okay. Well, one thing about factivity is that it's very highly configurable, right? So we take everything that we've ever learned in factivity, every modification, not customization. Okay? We typically like to say we don't do customizations, but we will modify the product to enhance what it does today to get it ready for the next customer and the next customer and the next customer. So as we start to make modifications in the product, maybe it was customer focused, we can reuse that to tackle the next customer's unique situation. Uh, sometimes customers look at our enhancement list and go, why would anybody need that? But then they're the same customer when they ask us for something, say, well, if we use this feature that we put in, it solves your problem. Uh, and so that's a big deal of factivity. Uh, another thing is factivity has a station concept. So every single terminal or PC that's on the floor running Factivity can be configured differently. So you could share a screen with multiples. You could have it on a single machine. So you have a lot of flexibility there. Plus the behaviors can change. Do I need uh, to have multiple operators or the, can they only select the first job from a list or maybe the first three? All of that can be configured. Right? Maybe at this area, they could uh, cherry pick, if you will, different jobs as um, they have the freedom to do that. But over here, they can't. So you can control that at what we call the factivity station level. When we look at an area of the factory, that's what we're trying to understand. Right? How is that manufacturing performed and how does the operator report their data? Right? And we review the enterprise transactions that would be reported. You know, for the most part, they're fairly 
standard, right? You've got runtime, you've got problem time, you've got this, that, and the other thing. So there's a pretty finite list of data that can be sent to the enterprise system. So how are they collected? You know, how, what determines that? How about the materials, right? Are there attributes to any of that, right? When I have production, do I have to know some particular details that have to be collected? Uh, Factivity provides a lot of flexibility without customizations, without modifications, where you can just plug and play different keypads to say, here, I, uh, I need to collect these two bits of information. I need to collect these four bits of information. I need to collect these four bits of information. But this one is actually calculated based on some other data. All of that kind of stuff is the stuff that's built in to what we do with Factivity and that Factivity station. Uh, machine integration is an interesting one here, too. You know, we need to work with your integrators and your engineers to understand signals, but let's look at a simple one, right? One of the hardest ones to get is when is the machine running? What determines that the machine is actually in a run state? Is it because the power's on? Is it because the door is closed? Is it when the power is on and the door closed and the button is pressed and the light goes on and this head moves two inches? Any of that. <laughs> you know, it's the kind of things that we need to figure out. I mean, so it sounds easy. When's a machine running? Well, <laughs> how do we get that out of signals, right? What kind of signals do we pull together to get that? So we like to think that our overall implementation arc is generally short. And when we combine that with customers, uh, with a customer's implementation team that's dedicated and motivated, uh, and motivated, you know, we get good success then. So we spend a lot of time. Um, trying to get to that success. But as I said before, you know, to also try to have a satisfied customer. Well said. I like that. And I, I picked up in that uh, answer, Oscar, again, I think a common theme again is just the, the really the focus on the customer, you know, it, you know, just really understanding the customer and not just the product, right? I mean, you guys understand the product, of course, but it's really how to make that product work for the customer, you know, considering the operators, uh, what are the needs uh, on the floor? How do you make it efficient? And it sounds to me like you have a methodology and, and some key ideas that you think through in order to, to bring all that together. Um, Oscar, it's been a fun conversation. Um, this is really a topic that I enjoy. This is a big part of what we do is to help guide and work with businesses to help uh, improve their data, right? And, and improve business intelligence. And obviously MES and OEE and Industry 4.0 is a, is a major part of that solution. But before I let you go, I have one more question. And that is, if you're going to give advice, and I say this on the podcast all the time, this is one of my favorite questions, because at the end of the day, this podcast was really designed just to share and learn from each other. But if you had to give advice to an organization regarding successful MES implementations as a tool for business continuous improvement and value realization, what would you say in terms of learning, leadership, and culture? So what little nugget can you leave our listeners with in that regard? Well, I mentioned a few things already that give you how MES can help you use things like Industry 4.0 and also hopefully like a product like Factivity. And we're not the only product in the market, and we know that. But how to make your operation processes more productive and informative. So MES is a group of tools, right? They not only streamline data collection, again, there's that word, um, but also can provide time, analytics, enterprise interfacing, machine interfacing, all that stuff. For those companies that have implemented MES through Factivity, I believe you'll find successes and an overall satisfaction. At least I know I'd like to hope so. Um, the original leadership saw an opportunity when we thought about this 30 years to enrich the factory floor okay, and gain the benefits of assisting there. You know, as Factivity, we continue to push these goals and focus on it. You know, at every single implementation, any company looking to bring an MES online has to focus on this. And I hope Factivity will be the product that will lead a lot of them there. I do appreciate um, you talking to me about Factivity, uh, certainly a product dear to my heart. Yeah. Well, Oscar, thank you so much for your time. It, it was really a pleasure, and I appreciate uh, talking to you as well uh, about Factivity and letting our listeners learn uh, some more about the product. We truly appreciate your dedication to the trade and you and the Factivity team. And, and like I said, I'm quite familiar with Factivity, and I know over the years you've developed your product, and, um, and it's, a, it's a very sound product. It's fair to say that. But um, Oscar, can you tell our listeners uh, how they can get in touch with you or Factivity to learn more? Sure. 
Well, you can reach Factivity through email at info at Factivity.com. Remember, Factory Activity, uh, Factivity.com. Or you can phone us at our 800 number, 800-369-6377, or a uh, local number, 216-514-5141. And certainly check out the website. You can chat on the website. You can also request some of the documents that we talked a little bit about, some of the myths, and those are available, and we'll get those out to you if you request them. That sounds good. And we'll be sure to include that information as well, uh, Oscar, of course, in our show notes. Well, Oscar, thank you again. Uh, Be well, and we'll talk soon. Okay, thank you very much, Jack. I appreciate the time. You bet. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of the ERP OCJ podcast. This podcast is intended as a forum to study, share, and discuss ERP organizational change successes and challenges. We discuss the people, process, and technological components of ERP organizational change by drawing on knowledge from extensive research, collaborative learning, and practitioner expertise and experience. We are incredibly grateful to have friends, colleagues, and mentors join us in our podcast as we seek to promote, connect, and foster relationships in the ERP organizational change community and contribute to its success by bringing research and practice closer together. We want to make sure this is the most useful and insightful ERP podcast you listen to, and we'd love your help in doing so by leaving us feedback and a review. A great place to do so is at Apple Podcasts. Just click on the Listen in Apple Podcasts link, then click Ratings and Reviews, and let us know your thoughts. You can get more info about the show, including show notes and episode highlights for this and all of our episodes by visiting nestleandassociates.com and clicking the podcast option. Please join us again next week as we discuss the latest ERP organizational change research, practice, and stories. And don't forget to follow us on social media, hashtag the ERP OCJ. Thanks again for listening. Have a fantastic week.